which brings yeah. me to a guy like Paul George. And you said it. When Paul is locked in, he is every 15-year-old's favorite player. Smooth, smooth game, all of that stuff, right? He's got a $48 million option for next season. I would think that Paul George at, what, 33 is going to say, you know what, I'm going to turn down this 48 and I'm going to get me long money because you get your long money while you have your health. Right. In a second apron tax world, how does that work? Because well, we're hearing about teams that want to make a run at Paul George in the summer. And that to me sounds, A, really intriguing, but also law. Why would teams be feeling like they can go and make a run at Paul George to maybe be their third best player, whatever the case may be? He should be cemented as a clipper. He should be, right? But clearly something isn't quite connected there right now. How important is the next two months for Paul George? I think for Paul, Paul's one of those players where his basketball mortality has been a conversation for a long time. I mean, we're talking about 10, he's coming up on 10 years since that yep. leg break playing at the Olympics that changed his whole career. Uh, you know, like we were talking about Paul as that next guy uh, for a reason. It's not just what he was doing individually. He was leading a really hard to watch Indiana Pacers team, the back-to-back conference finals. Okay. A Pacers team that hadn't had any level of postseason success since Malice at the Palace. And like, that's, that's who Paul George established himself to be before year five. And Paul George's fifth year in the league was spent recovering from this leg fracture. And that dude worked so hard that he got back in time where everyone else who suffers the same injuries, remember the conversation with Gordon Hayward, I mean, Rachel Nichols couldn't go a month without mentioning, hey, Gordon Hayward might come back for the Celtics because of what happened with Paul. It's like, nah, they ain't built the same. And nope. so ever since then, you know, Paul's had more. He's had something every year since he joined Oklahoma City. You know, he has gotten to the he has not gotten to the playoffs in one piece since leaving Indiana. You know, his two years in OKC. It was one thing or another. It was the knee, the show- it was the elbow, the, 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 the shoulders. The year where he finished third in MVP vote, and he had the uh, the shoulder pro- problem that really hindered him exactly. in the playoffs against, uh, against Portland, Portland, I want to say. Yeah, against Portland. And it was a damn shame because, yeah, like that dude was arguably the best two-way player in the league. Like literally top three in MVP, top three in defense player of the year. Playing with Russell Westbrook, who was in that man's ear, pushing him to be his best. That has, you know, we've seen that void filled again. Russell Westbrook has a way of getting guys to, you know, be engaged in ways that whether you're a star or role player, you don't have like that's what's special about about this group. So with Paul, it's like on one hand, you're playing every game with your parents there, your boys there, you're playing your teammates in the locker room. You know, you got those guys there. One of your assistant coaches is Brian Shaw who was there with you when you ascended to that star status in Indiana. Another assistant coach is Dante Jones, who was your, you know, your vet when he was a rookie. There's a real family there, you know, like Paul wants to be here. And at the same time, Paul knows what organization he joined. And you know what? Paul knows how he joined that organization. He signed a long-term extension with OKC after being there for a year because the vibes were that good. Like the relationship was there. He's like, I'm not even going to meet with the Lakers. I'm going to be here a year later. He's like, I'm going to take this contract that I signed with y'all to go home and join my other boys. So, you know, it can go both ways. You know, yep. the Clippers, I always go back to this. I mentioned this to you over the summer. They signed Blake Griffin and traded Chris Paul. And Blake didn't even make it to MLK Day. First year of that contract extension. What's stopping the Clippers from doing the same thing? You know? The Clippers know that they can't give Paul a blank check. They didn't even do that for Kawhi. So the conversations have been open. I don't think there's any animosity there. I think it's just natural difficulties when you're talking about everything hitting at you at once. It's not just a business decision. It is emotional when it comes to the contract. The fact that, you know, this is a whole lot easier to take whatever's on the table if you win a championship or you touch the championship. OK, every team that gets to a finals, they don't win it. But damn it, they they feel it. They, yep. they they see they see the ropes. They see things looking a lot different. They see the fact that they're the only two teams playing. 
the Clippers have never experienced that as a franchise. And Paul's the only one of those future Hall of Famers who's never experienced that environment as a player. He's been in the conference finals three times and hasn't been able to break through. He's the guy that everyone's looking forward to seeing. He is a guy who, you know, he's still in, he's still going to All-Star in Indiana and Utah. And he said every time, I don't know if I'll be back here. He knows the landscape of the league. He knows where he's at. Paul is a very conscious basketball player and very conscious participant in where he is in basketball uh, history, where his legacy is. Every This is the most important thing for him. I think James will be fine. Kawhi obviously has his contract. And I think Russ is at a certain level of peace with everything with him. You know, um, yeah, yeah. Russ is already on the other side of, hey, he's not making that money now. You know, everything's interesting with Paul because there's so many different ways this can go depending on how deep the Clippers go in the playoffs. Man. I think when we look back on it, we're going to um, be able to sort of document how impressive 2021 was for Paul George, because he went from being, hey, Ka- Kawhi Leonard's taking the you know the tougher matchup, he's a high usage guy, to all of a sudden I have to carry this team out of the second round. You know, of course, you had the Terrence Mann 40 point game a- against Utah that that certainly helped, but. Paul George was the catalyst for that team coming to within two games of the NBA Finals. One of those games was the uh, Valley Oop or whatever the hell we call it that, uh, you know, that that last that last second thing. You're basically saying that to some degree. Three years ago was the best that we were going to see Paul George was the closest that we could have seen the Clippers to get in the championship and they were without their best player. And they didn't have this level of star power behind it. It was Kawhi, Paul George, and a bunch of good players that were riding this wave. And now you don't, like you said at the start of the show, the vibes aren't that great right now. But everybody knows what's at stake. So I I, I say that to circle here, Law. You have the Intuit Dome opening up. And I don't think people understand how big that is for them to have their own home to have their own identity, to be separate from the L.A. Live Lakers. You know what I mean? You're moving the G League team to San Diego, back to San Diego, where where the Clippers were before they moved to Los Angeles in the, you know, in the mid-'80s. How big of the, is this for the Clippers as a franchise for the next couple of years, for the next couple of months, and putting real imprints? And we talked about this a little bit before, the street lights over – you know, starlights or whatever that, you know, that slogan. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was, but how right. important is this for them? Because the Lakers are in the play and the Clippers are not for them to try to gain some turf in LA, not just a championship, but turf. I mean, we've been talking about that for the better part of a dozen years. Like the Lakers, it's, it's, it's an anomaly when they're good. I know what the franchise history is. I know what the bubble gave us. Uh, even last year when they made their run. But, I mean, the Lakers have rarely been better than the Clippers basically since uh, Kobe Bryant tore his Achilles tendon. And so we've had this conversation about, hey, your playoff success could really make a difference. And they just, you know, they haven't broken through and taken advantage of it as a franchise. It doesn't matter who who's been playing – uh, it doesn't matter who's been coaching. It doesn't matter what the uniforms have looked like, damn it. Like, we've had this conversation for the better part of a decade. So it's more of the same there, you know. It, yeah, you have an opportunity to close the damn building down and, you know, do it with these guys on the team. So many guys that have an area connection. That's the thing. The Clippers have really – they've they've tried to build a footprint in L.A. that goes beyond – basketball that goes beyond the players on the team like you know you you go to these parks and recreation centers and there's a clippers logo on all of them that's what the bomber family has done as far as just beautifying the area like making it a community thing so i mean it's got to be basketball though you know you got to win at a time when no one else is watching anyone else the clippers have mastered this is 13 years in a row Vinny, where they've had a winning season there's only six other teams in franchise and in, in NBA league history that have a longer 
streak of winning seasons. Okay. And I think of only two that didn't Spurs. have a championship Spurs attached won, to them. Right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Spurs went, what, 20 some years. Right. But there's only been two of those teams that did it without attaching championship. That was the Utah Jazz during their run and the Blazers during their uh, run that started with Clyde and ended um, in, the, in, in the late 2000s. So, like, I, I, I look at this Clippers uh, team and, and where they are as a franchise, as far as a foothold goes, yeah, the Unto Dome is an opportunity that they're never going to have again. They're never going to, you know, I'm sure they'll probably move into a building long after we're done covering the league and, and whatnot, uh, or at least my robot hasn't been developed yet <laughs> to, to think about those things. But, like, no, nah, like, for everybody's relevant time in, in this generation, this era that we're in, like, yeah, you only get one into a dome. You only get one chance to do this in this time. And it's even more special because of the players. Like, these guys don't – it's not like they came from Texas and Florida and – and and New York, they're they're LA guys, right? They're invested here. Like this means something. This means as much to them as it does the franchise, right? So the stories has been written. Ownerships love stories, um, but you the the thing is, you got to actually you know fulfill whatever you've written, and that's the hard part. That's the part that the Clippers again they haven't mastered that. This team in a vacuum is capable of winning a championship, Vinny. They still are, even with the nasty basketball that they've played for the greater part of a month and a half. Their issue isn't themselves, it's everybody else. You should trust any of the other top teams in the West more than the Clippers right now, just based off of what we've seen. The evidence is the evidence. And there are two teams that it, this means a lot for this year. The Clippers are one, the Phoenix Suns are the other, and for completely different reasons. But that is why I think the Western Conference playoffs will be extremely extremely intriguing. I always like hanging out in L.A. during the playoffs. I'm not one of those people that says, yeah, let's see Oklahoma City in the NBA Finals. Yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah, and T.S. got to stay there for five or six days in a row, and you got to find something to do. Like, other than that, you know what I mean? Like, but seriously, the Clippers putting it together would actually be a really good story for the NBA. And it certainly does not hurt that you have a guy like Steve Ballmer, who's a crazy person. I say that affectionately. He's a crazy person. Kawhi Leonard is a playoff terminator who can maybe still get there. And Paul George, who Law went deep on, is a very intriguing player for the present and the future. That, ladies and gentlemen, is my man Law Murray from The Athletic.